Melvina, would you like to give the invocation this morning? Father, we just thank you for this morning, Lord, that you brought us back together. Thank you for all your blessings, Lord, and during this holiday season, I just ask you to be with each and every one. Lord, and be with the people in, in South that have been in the storm. Lord, you know their needs this morning. We just ask that you take them through. Thank you for everything and bless us in your name. Amen. Amen. Hi, right, Shelly, roll call. Yes, sir. Mike Shambaugh. Here. Joe Deere. Aye. Keith Austin. Here. Danny Callison. Here. Julia Coates. Here. Sean Crittenden. Here. Mike Dobbins. Here. Rex Jordan. Here. Johnny Kidwell. Here. Daryl Legg. Wes Nofire. Here. Dora Petskowski. Here. Joshua Sam. Here. Melvina Shop Pouch. Honey. E.O. Smith. Here. Condessa Tihi, <coughs> Victoria Vesquez, we have a quorum. Okay. Doc, if you're on the line, I, I think you're muted, uh, if you can hear me. Okay, if you've had a chance to look over the minutes, I need any motions. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Okay, let's move on down to reports. First off, we have from the Marshal Service, Shannon Buell. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, other than my report, my written report, one thing I'd really like to bring out is the work that my conservation uh, wildlife team has been doing uh, since deer season. Uh, we've gotten together natural resources and uh, uh, We've done several youth hunts. Uh, we've also done a veterans hunt. Uh, I hope that maybe some of your people have called you uh, about these hunts. Uh, my officers are working really, really hard to, to try to help citizens go out and, uh, especially youth, and, and get a deer or try their <coughs> best to get a deer. Uh, we also have a hunt that's coming up uh, the 20th, I believe. Uh, that we're taking some uh, kids that are in foster care, uh, Cherokee youth that are in foster care, out to a hunt as well. Uh, so it's a new program we started this year with Natural Resources, uh, and I think it's it's a program that's quite frankly been needed to, to get the, the, the youth uh, in our area out uh, with a police officer, with somebody <coughs> of that statute. Uh, stature and not be in trouble, not be, you know, us taking their family member to jail or doing something like that, but to actually get out in the woods and learn what it is to to be outside. So I wanted to, to bring that to, to you other than what's in the written report. So if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Does anybody have any questions for uh, Marshall Buell? <clears throat> Wes? Yeah, on those uh, youth hunts, are, are we... Um, Working in connection with any of the kids that are coming out of ICW foster situation if they're in a foster home? We have three of them at the hunt in December that's coming out of ICW. Okay, yes. perfect. And then how many uh, uh, current patrolmen do we have now on our force? So total marshals, that's patrol, investigations, everything else. We have 44 right now, that's including me. Okay. Uh, that includes the 14 that just got back from Fletzy that are in their what's called their FTO phase which is their field training office phase. Uh, that lasts about four months. Uh, they should be getting out of that phase about the third week of January. Okay. And then those officers will actually be able to start responding to, to normal calls and doing, doing the tribe's work. Okay. And then far as our uh, agreements with our jails, does that go through you or is that going through Sarah Hill? goes through me. Now, okay. uh, the AG's office reads them to make sure they're legal and all the stuff that they need to do, but I'm the one that signs the jail agreement. Now, now um, to my understanding, we have we don't have an agreement in place or we're not in conjunction to have an agreement with Cherokee County and Delaware County. We do have one in Cherokee County. It's active right now. It's active right now, and we're, we're utilizing it. We're not... Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Because I've just I've talked to some some officers and stuff there, and there's been some confusion on well, what's going on with that. Well, well one of the things we're going to do, we're, we have what we're looking at is long term facilities. Right. And Cherokee County is not one of those. They, right. I don't think they want to be. Right. 
So we're moving inmates from Cherokee County to other places for that long term. So Washington County is one of our long term facilities. Uh, Delaware County, uh, we're waiting on uh, the DA's office in Delaware right. uh, to get their contract signed, get it to us, we'll be signing it. Uh, the acting sheriff, uh, James Beck, uh, I've known him for quite a while. Uh, he's a man of honor, and I think that he will run that jail facility uh, with honor and make sure that our inmates are taken care of. And that's my, my first priority uh, is to make sure our, our tribal inmates are treated the right way and taken care of. So <clears throat> these transports that we're having, since we're transporting criminals on, on a regular basis, that's taken our patrolmen off side of being able to patrol and secure the area, correct? Absolutely. So um, wouldn't it be more indicative right now for the current setting to keep our citizens in place and in-house right here at Cherokee County until we're able to either staff enough people or, or have something, like you said, more long-term in place? I just don't want to see a lack of patrolmen out there in the area. And then also, I, I think there's probably some criminals who are getting released because they're being held uh, longer than we're, longer than the county is allowed to hold them without without current charges being filed because they're not moving them out to a different county. Well, that's, that's why we're moving them out, any of the long-term holds. Mm -hmm. Most of the moves that we have to do, quite frankly, are moves to court and back from court. Right. Uh, like this month, we moved 90 prisoners right. uh, between the, the different jails all over the, right. the 14 to Tahlequah for court. So a, a, a lion's share of our moves aren't necessarily from one jail to the other. It's that jail facility to the court for their proceedings and back to that jail facility. Right. Okay. Well, hopefully we get that cleared up. I know there was a guy that was held in there for five days without any charges being filed, which would be against his constitutional rights. So it's a concern on the transfer and stuff. And I know there's a lot of kinks to work out, but I uh, appreciate you giving us that information. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Right. Thank you, Chair. Anybody else? Now that's a, a problem with uh, every department goes through when it seems like the, the work really starts after <laughs> they're incarcerated because then uh, there's no saying, you know, if you, if you shoot it, you got to skin it and catch it and skin it. So it doesn't end there, you know, endless, endless uh, transports back and forth to court. Um, gosh, and manpower for us, even in my department, it's difficult uh, when we have way more short staff than them, but it's just something you got to do and until we get more <clears throat> Marshals and you know, we're obviously headed that way, but um, I think this is a problem that everybody runs into It's just a difficult thing uh, manpower uh, But everything that goes into people's rights, you know, they have a, a different kind of rights that have to be upheld and um it's just the way it is in today's world. You know, you, you have to, once you get them, you have to take care of them. So, and you have to make sure they go to court. I mean, that's their right to a speedy trial. So there's just a lot of things that goes in that. And I feel for you, but, uh, it, you know, hopefully it'll get better. I know you guys are, uh, my gosh, your arrests and, and your cases have skyrocketed. I mean, I, I know just it's, it's there, you got a ton. So, um, well, just this week alone, we're working five possible homicides just this week. Yeah. That'll tell you the the tempo of our agency right now. Yeah, it's uh, and I know about a couple of them. So um, keep your head up. You're doing a good job. It's just it's just difficult. We understand. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. From the Office of the Attorney General, is Sarah Hill here? Yep, she is. Good morning. Usually these are at 2 o'clock, so I feel a little under-caffeinated for the entire Tribal Council, but I'll do my best. Um, so the, I'll just briefly touch on the hunting and fishing compact. I know that uh, I saw that Secretary Harsha really covered it pretty extensively yesterday, but of course um, the compact has expired, or it will expire at the end of this month. There will have to be, um, you know, a lot of work put in between now and then to help inform our citizens about what their rights are and um, what the risks are if you if you were dealing with a my, one of my concerns has been is that tribal citizens will feel like the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation cannot ticket them um, after January 1st 
That's not true. We are cross-deputized with ODWC, and so they will, they will continue to write tickets. But those tickets will come to the tribal court, just like they do for all other law enforcement, to be prosecuted in the tribal court, consistent with our laws. Um, so it's, I think it's important for our citizens to continue to listen to ODWC uh, game wardens, to be um, cooperative with them, because they do have jurisdiction in our reservation under the cross-step. Um, so that was one of the things I wanted to be sure and share with all of you um, as a point I'm not sure that I had made clearly before. Um, to give you a quick update on the tribal court cases and processes that we, are, we have, I report these numbers every month. During my last report, we had filed 2,520 new criminal cases since McGirt, um, or since the Hogner case. Today that number is uh, 2,836. So we've put on approximately 300 plus cases in the last uh, four weeks. And that's, you know, somewhere around 100 cases a week seems to be where we're at at the moment, a little, a little over 100 cases a week. We've also received 390 referrals for juvenile offenses to date, up from 300 that were reported last month. So almost 90 new referrals. Um, the big issue that I want to discuss with you today is this in the Supreme Court of the United States, because we're coming up on some, um, as I've been reporting to you for some time, Oklahoma has undertaken a campaign of appealing every criminal case involving a dismissal from the state courts to the Supreme Court and asking for cert. I'm asking for one of two things, always the first, always asking that McGirt be overturned, and occasionally asking a second question, which is, can the state of Oklahoma exert jurisdiction over non-Indians on the reservation? Um, I mean, over, yeah, non-Indian defendants who commit crimes against Indians on the reservation. And those have been the two questions that they have been kicking up to the Supreme Court. Um, so these petitions have been circulating for a while. There are 45 of them now at the Supreme Court asking one or both of these questions that I just talked to you about. Of those petitions, those 45, 33 were distributed on December 8th to the justices for consideration on the court's January 7th, 2022 conference. And then orders from that conference could come as early as January 10th. So here we're moving into the phase. Now, they're, they're not deciding the case, but they're only thinking about whether or not they should accept cert. Do we want to look at this question again? Um, and, and I could tell you what I think about it, and I could attempt to predict it, and all of that would be worth, you know, whatever it's worth. The court's going to do what it's going to do. But I do want to, did want all of you to know that whatever they're going to do, they're probably going to do it in early January. Um, sometimes the court will kick cases out. So they'll say, okay, we, we considered it at this conference, but we, we're not done thinking about it or talking about it yet. We're going to reschedule it for, for further discussion at a later conference. So there's no guarantee that they will decide at that meeting what they're going to do, but it's possible that they could. Um, the Cherokee cases that were distributed for conference that day are Castro Huerta, Cottingham, McCombs, which is also a Muskogee Creek case because the crime occurred on the Cherokee Reservation and then continued to occur over in the Muskogee Nation. Uh, McDaniel, Shriver, and Spears are the Cherokee cases that are currently set for conference. But there are cases from all of the five tribes set for that conference. So there's one from the Seminole only have one case. Um, the Muskogee have more than we have set for that day. So this seems to be, you know, coming to a head in front of the Supreme Court. Of course, what I would hope that the Supreme Court would do is immediately just decline all of them because they just heard this case a year ago. And for them to take up and reconsider the whole issue you know, just a year later uh, would be a remarkable thing for the court to do. But sometimes the court does remarkable things. Um, but I just wanted to put that on your radar because I think that's the most important thing that we're facing in the next few weeks. And other than that, I'll be happy to answer any questions to the extent that I can. Sean? Sarah, the hunting and fishing. So make sure I can explain this to my folks right. So after January 1, they go fishing. And game warden comes up. And be courteous to the game warden, of course. They might write them a ticket and just say thank you. But that ticket's going to our courts, right? That's right. And you're going to look at it and, of course, make sure that, you know, the conservation laws, you know, that it can't be spotlighting and get thrown at. We're still going to go by, like uh, Mr. Harsha explained, the, you know, the states, uh, you know, how many deer you can get or fish you can catch. We're still going to go by that. But it's going to come through our offices and just – your regular, you didn't have a licensed one, will more than likely get tossed. Yeah, they would 100% be tossed because they do have a license under our law, and our law is what I enforce. 
right? Okay. So if our law says that, that if you have your tribal citizenship card and, and that's what you need to hunt and fish on the Cherokee reservation, then, I, that, then there wasn't a crime because it's not a violation of the law. Now, I, I don't think that ODWC will be out. I mean, ODWC officers have been, you know, they, they understand what's going mm -hmm. on. Um, I don't think they're going to be out writing a bunch of tickets for that, but I also know the governor's, you know, he has a, a different view of the situation than I think all of the people around him. Um, so I don't, I don't know. Um, I think, but the important thing to me is that the tribal citizen, you know, they're on their reservation, just like for any other crime, whether it's poaching. I mean, I, I absolutely, I'll prosecute those cases because right. it's against the law of the Cherokee Nation, and it's right. my job to enforce those laws, just like it's the marshal's job. We, that's what we do. Um, so we'll enforce those laws, but it's not a violation of our law to hunt and fish if you're a citizen and you have your card. All right. Okay. Well, that's, that's good to take back to the many questions we'll have. And I, I'm sure you will get many questions, and I think you should direct all of them to Chad Harsha instead of me. That would be my preference. Just start there. <laughs> and then if he has questions, then he can call me. No, Thank but you can, always, of course you can always call me. I try to answer all your phone calls. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Danny. Yes. Ms. Hill, there's a rumor floating around in, in my district that, that uh, the court system down here is dismissing a lot of cases. Is that, I mean, and, and, and from law enforcement up there, you know, we're trying to bridge the gap between the McGurk decision and, and, and you know, letting these folks go. Then if somebody steals their car or steals their tractor or herds their cows down to the sale barn, you know, I mean, they're blaming the Cherokee Nation because nobody's prosecuting them. Then if they start with this dismissal deal, it, it really puts a lot of heat on us. And, I, you know, I just want for the council's sake, I, I know there's some that do and some that don't, but... Is that just, that's probably a rumor? I think that is a rumor. I think that the question, I mean, of course the court does dismiss cases and, then, and we dismiss cases sometimes. I think one of the questions, it, it is very easy, right, in this environment, I think where the governor, you know, really encourages blaming the tribes for anything that, that goes wrong. But if, for instance, you know, the Cherokee Nation gets a right, we get a, a ticket, but there's no report attached. And so then we tell the law enforcement agency that sent it to us, hey, law enforcement agency, we got this ticket, but we have no report attached. So we have no evidence. We're going to decline this case until we can get the report from you or we get the other evidence. And so then they will say, well, Cherokee Nation is just dismissing these cases. Yeah. Well, yeah, we might dismiss a case if we don't have the report. And I don't mean this right. on any, for the most part, the law enforcement and the counties and then the cities are incredibly diligent and good at what they do. And there's good cooperation between us and those people. But there are certainly, um, there are lots of different factors that could cause a case to be dismissed. And a lot, and our, I know that my prosecutors um, are very diligent about making sure, but we, we can't file a case. We can't move forward with a case just because some officer said it happened. We have to have the evidence of that in front of us. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Melvina? I understand there's going to be a court like out in community, like in Jay. Uh, is that going to be monthly, quarterly, or just? From time to time. So the, as I understand it, the J Courthouse should be near completion. It, I think it'll be basically ready to use at the end of this month. They're still working on some technology things, mm -hmm. I think. Um, we haven't set down, of course, it's up to the court ultimately how often they want to have dockets and where. Mm -hmm. um, but we will have that facility available at the end of this month, and it will be used for having court. But I couldn't tell you today what those dockets are going to look like, and it may be that it's, you know, it starts out a couple days a month, mm -hmm. um, or maybe that the court decides, hey, we, we want to do this once a week because of the volume of cases we have there. And um, that's a conversation that we're going to have to have with the court, and they'll ultimately be the deciders on that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Wes? Hey, Sarah. Uh, how many court cases are we currently handling, or are they currently handling a week? Well, uh, you know, like I said, I think it's roughly, you know, we're getting in new cases, we're getting roughly 100, 100 plus filed a week. Okay, and how many are being handled by the courts a week? Like, how many are they processing a week through the courts? Then it's the exact same number. So if we file them, the court has to process them. So they're so they're having court cases a hundred they're having a hundred court cases a week upstairs. We probably have a hundred today okay. <laughs> set on, on the docket today. I don't know exactly how many we have on the docket, but my people will be up in the courthouse all day today. Yeah, I know your people will. I was just I guess that that's kind of the wonder how our courts are actually operating upstairs, which is separate from the attorney general's office um, as far as their staffing and stuff goes. I think we hired one and a half new uh, judges since McGirt. Um, so, you know, obviously we now are talking about another court opening up 
and how many justices are we planning to bring up there? Just was curious about the creation and how many are being processed currently upstairs. Um, and then uh, I guess you've you've read and you have a copy of the Department of Interior's letter regarding the UKB uh, land and trust. I do. Okay. Um, now I read the same letter and nowhere in it does it have anything as a statement of who holds sole jurisdiction. Um, so I think the chief misinterpreted the letter and its statement to the public because there's no current regulatory mechanism for the Department of Interior to take tribal land out of trust, which is not what I understand the letter to be saying. Basically because of McGirt, the Department of Interior would need to take new legal analysis of McGirt as it applies to the UKB if they want to reapply for their 2.03 their 2 acres into trust. I just wanted to bring that to the attention because it was a very public statement <clears throat> as that Cherokee Nation had sole jurisdiction, which that's not what the letter stated. So that way when we're moving forward, we're not targeting our brothers and sisters, whether you're regarding your register with the UKB, Cherokee Nation, or Eastern Band. We're all Cherokees and just, you know, let's not misinterpret the, the letter and what it meant there just to attack someone. So that's just kind of what I wanted to say, the statement on that letter there. Other than that, um, I know you guys are dealing with a lot. I'd like to try to figure out a way and there's anything we can do for council to try to ease all the, the work that you guys are doing, whether it's helping create more jobs, uh, also with the courts, creating with them. So appreciate it. Appreciate it, Speaker. Mr. Speaker. I just Go wanted to, to briefly respond to the issue about the UKB, which I, I probably should have reported on. Um, what the UKB decision at Interior is, and just to briefly walk you through it, because I think it's important. Um, it, what happened in that, that de administrative decision by the BIA was them walking back the decision that they made in 2012. So in 2012, the BIA issued a letter which said that the Cherokee Reservation for purposes of this land into trust acquisition, which was this 2.03 acres, which is the, what was the formerly the gaming parcel of the UKB, that the Department of the Interior intended to take that piece of land into trust for gaming purposes because it was in the former reservation of the UKB. And of course, there is no former reservation for the UKB. So we felt like that that decision by Interior was incorrect when it was made. So that case, so we challenged that in the Northern District of Oklahoma in front of Judge Frizzell. Judge Frizzell issues a decision and says that the UKB has no former reservation and that the land cannot be taken into trust for the UKB under that theory. Then the UKB and the United States appeal that case up to the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals where it has been for the past more than a year, um, just sitting at the Tenth Circuit. And in the meantime, McGirt happens. And so Interior goes back and they completely withdraw that 2012 decision. And in the letter that is referenced that, that Councilman Nofire is talking about, Interior specifically references and acknowledges the decision of the federal court in the Northern District where they observed that there was no reservation, former reservation for the UKB. Now that letter goes on to say they will, you know, they will make other analysis in the future. That may be true. But the, the Interior has completely withdrawn their prior decision about the former reservation of the UKB. And that, that, so that is dead letter. And it acknowledged, specifically acknowledged the decision of the federal district court. Now what Interior does next, I couldn't tell you. That's up to Interior. But that's what, that's what happened in that case. That's where we're at. All right. Any other questions for Attorney General Hill? All right. Thank you for the clarification. Um, good report. All right. Thank you. Next, uh, we have Gwen Terrapin with FOIA and GRA. Good morning. It's good to see all of you. Good morning. Uh, my report is still the same. We have 16 requests, 15 FOIA, and one GRA. Everything's been updated, and you guys should have a copy of that. And any time that you guys want to look at any of the, the responses and stuff that we put out there, whether it's from years past or recent, all you got to do is just shoot me an email, and I'll be glad to get that information to you because we don't have any links on the on the reports to be able to look at the information. Is there any questions for Gwen? Wes? Hey Gwen, uh, appreciate everything you're doing. I know I've requested several things before in the past years. Uh, one thing I think it came up yesterday 
was um, the donation amount um, contributions made from C and B. I requested those as a GRI request, and it was I think it's three years I requested. Uh, nowhere in that request did it show where a public statement was made by CNB withdrawing a $150,000 donation to the Republican AG. In my GRA request, it did not show that in there. So considering the fact that CNB was very public about that donation and it didn't mm -hmm. show up in that GRA request, who would I go back to, to to say either someone's not disclosing the information for my request, would that come back to you, and then you guys would argue with CNB? specifically for the end going okay am I going to get the full request now because obviously something Cherokee Nation business is dated October 23rd uh, 2020 that relation to this 150 um, I don't know why it um, Because it was not in the report, and okay. I looked back through my emails of reports in that October as well, and it didn't show up in my email or anything that had been provided to me. Okay. Well, I have a memorandum from 2020, so I'll give it to you after this is over. Yes, sir? Or I'll have the girls send it to everybody. Let's put that way. All right. Is there any other questions? All right. Thank you. Did you have something? Anything else? You're kind of two-stepping. I am. I'm sorry. I was going to say, I, I can't explain why it wasn't in the GRA, because the GRA that was submitted uh, by the councilman requested 501C3, 501C4, 501C5, and 501C6 contributions. And you know, we'll typically presume that the counselor is asking for the information that they want, so that's what was provided. RAGA is a 527 political organization, so there wasn't a request for 527 political organizations, and that's why it wasn't submitted. But of course, if there's a follow-up request for 527 political organization donations, then you know, then that, that that new request would be complied with. All right, thank you. All right, next we have uh, Sharon Swepson. From the Tax Commission. Good morning. Good morning. I believe you do have my report. I'll try to answer any questions that you might have. Does anybody have any questions for Sharon? Keith? Hi, Sharon. Uh, the, I understand that the state is uh, taking back the uh, Welcome Center leases soon, at some point soon. Okay. They're in Catoosa, obviously, that's where our tag office is, and we are in the process of building something new. Are we going to get that done before the lease expires? Um, I would hope so. I need to get with Chief of Staff and Construction. I know construction's going up and everything. I know they're working on it diligently, so I will get with them and follow up, and, and I'll send you something as soon as I get it from them. All right, thanks. Anybody else? Johnny? Good morning, ma'am. Uh, th thanks for being here today. I noticed on your report uh, under under the future plans down there, number two, where you'd already sent out 436 veteran sales tax uh, exemption cards. Yeah. I was I was just wondering, is there a way that we that we push that out in the Gadugi portal? And I I totally understand. There, there's about 4,000. Cherokee warriors that are signed up on that warrior database right now. I'm assuming that more than 400 or 500 of those are in close proximity to the, uh, you know, to uh, the reservation area or inside. Is there a way that we push out to that, let them know about that benefit? Um, I will get with the ones that's over the portal and see if we can get that information out there and get the applications out there uh, where that they can do that. So yeah, yes, thank you, I can do my best to get that out there. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh -huh. Anybody else? Um, how about the additional worker at Jay? I heard she was, there was, or he or she was in training. Yes. Are, are they through with the training or They're what's still the time? I She's going between both offices, but I believe she'll be at the Jay office permanently here within the next week or so. Yeah. I, I was up there the other day and, uh, man, uh, they, she, that little girl was swamped I and mean, she was the only one in there she was getting pounded so there was a ton of people out there so yeah. uh, it's hard to 
work that day and then take an hour, even have time to take an hour at lunch. And I know she came back early that day yeah, because. Yeah, and she does most days, so. Yeah, that's crazy, but she does a good job. Okay. Anybody else? Sharon, thank you. You have thank a good you. weekend. All right, from the Gaming Commission, Janice Purcell. I saw Janice. There she is. morning if you would turn your microphone on is it on now yes ma'am okay thank you I submitted my report and if there's any questions um, feel free to ask also we have a commission meeting this Thursday at 930 at the Hard Rock conference room and I want to say thank you to mr. Smith who was there at the last meeting. Um, and so everyone is invited to come to this meeting. And I will get the information out to those of the advisory meeting. Also, um, I want to give a shout out to your gaming team. They raised over $400 to give to the Angel Tree. And then they also gave over 100 toys to Toys for Tots. And this was just individually collecting things and toys. So I think that is super nice of them. Right. Does anyone have any questions? Does anybody have any questions for Janice? Condessa? Uh, you said that the Gaming Commission will be meeting this Thursday, the yes. 16th at 9.30 yes. a.m. Yes. at the Hard Rock Conference Room. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, Janice, that, that's a great job with uh, Toys for Tots. That's a, that's a wonderful thing to help kids that, you know, might not otherwise have a Christmas. So uh, hats off for that. That's, that's wonderful. So good report, and uh, you have a good day. You too. Thank you, and Merry Christmas. All right. Hey, good morning. Good morning. I'm not as nervous as I was last time. <laughs> the second round here. So uh, I submitted my report. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them in reference to the report. Just wanted to have some, some good news that we have uh, reviewed some of the um, recruitment process. Uh, we were able to reduce that down about three to five weeks. We're going to be implementing that in January. So we'll be shortening down without you know, without going through our normal process, but we'll be shorting them down that weeks that it will take to actually hire employees. So very excited about that and um, looking forward to change. The, the team has been fantastic. They've been accepting the change. So, um, so looking forward to exciting times. So any questions? Any questions for Samantha? Daryl? Samantha, I know that we put a halt on the CMC medical uh, vaccination mandates. Uh, has the mandates been lifted for new hires within the tribe? As far as on new hires, uh, we still, I mean, we're still hiring, the, obviously, the new hires, but uh, they have 45 days to, just like any other employee, only the new hires have 45 days to submit their information. And we'll, they'll follow right in the fold of employees of what we follow now, or what we are following. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Wes? Uh, just a quick question um, on our um, mandate that was put out. There's a medical and religious exemption. Uh, can I get that policy emailed over on how those exemptions will work so that way I can talk to the employees about it? I know Dr. Jones we're said still, that went out in the email. We're so. still working on, on that policy. Of course, obviously, we have the executive order, but we're still... We're still revising that policy right now. So that was a question that I'd had um, whenever the whenever it first went out as as uh, mandatory. You had to have the first shot by December fourth, but yet no one had an exemption policy. So it's kind of hard to to enforce something when there's not been a policy written well, I know, on how to exempt it. I know health had a, had a policy, so th that that's something that they had. Um, so, but. Um, it's a good question. I'll be happy to get back with you on it. Okay, great. Yeah, because that, that way if you have it, if they have a policy, then you need to have it. And then sure, that I way understand. they could send it on to me. Um, but if they don't have it, then that's the question that, that's, that's being asked. So appreciate it. Sure. Appreciate it, Speaker.
Danny? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we got an email the other day about uh, employee. What, was this the whole employee, the whole Cherokee Nation, changing their financial group? I will need to get back with you. I, I'm, I'll have to get back with you on that. Yeah. I, I mean, I might, may have read it wrong, but it said going from Lincoln to be okay. Oh, okay. You're talking about the 401k. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Was, yes, was, yes. That a, was that a nationwide deal, and, and was there issues or, or is and, that something we don't talk about? Um, not that I'm aware of that we don't talk about. Um, I know that we have we have changed to the BOK. Um, I also know that uh, we're doing training and trying to help the employees with the information. So, um, you know, that's where that's where we are. So, anybody else? Um, Samantha, if you would, when you uh, send that to Councilman Nofar, just uh, send it to Gail and. She'll send it to all of us. Okay, we'll do. Thank We'd you. like to all have it. So, all right, good report. Um, got off easy again, kind of. I don't know. You must <laughs> well, be. Do say, you're doing a good job. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Yes, Have a good yep. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas thank you. to you. <laughs> all right, let's move it on down to old business uh, number one. Wes, take that. Uh, yeah, this is the discussion and possible action on in, in on a formation of a tribal protection work group. Uh, this is something that we brought up last uh, month. There was a lot of di good discussion, and we carried it over to this month to try to bring it up again and, and go uh, forward looking at it. I know uh, we, have a, we had a condensed schedule last time, so I don't want to take up too much time this, with this either. But uh, the big reason to create this work group <clears throat> is to look at our government as a whole when it comes to pertaining to our ability to govern now that we're in full-fledged McGirt. I think a great, great example is just what happened with the hunting and fishing compact. Since that fell out, what our preparations do we have? What knowledge do we have in order to combat that? I know the administration's working their due diligence to try to be proactive as possible, but that is a good example of why a work group would be formed, is to take and look at the proactive laws and the ability that we have and start investing some time and in research into the past laws that were, that were passed or the past um, uh, United States uh, lawsuits that's already been had. Uh, you know, the, the last document that we had on how we could govern ourselves uh, proceeding to criminal action was in the 1866 treaty uh, on what we had for our setting laws. Uh, that treaty has since been dissolved by way of federal legislation, such as an enabling act uh, that dissolved our, our sovereign government at that time. However, the 1866 treaty could be used as a template uh, but once again, we aren't the 1836 constitutional government that we entered into in the 1866 treaty. Uh, we do not have a national council, for instance. We are, we are a tribal council made up of 17 instead of how the national council was set up out of 1836. <clears throat> so, you know, we, we can't kind of simply set on our hands here on this one when it comes to uh, allowing the administration to take full responsibility of McGirt. I think it's a good for us to uh, select number of us that who want to get down and, and, and spend some time working with our legal to counsel. We can call upon him and outlining a, a structure of, of how our meetings are going to partake, um, you know, such as like I just asked our marshals how many ha we have on patrol. There's 44 of them. The creeks are already up to 80. So how can we develop a program to get more marshals hired to help help out on that aspect? Also, we need to take a look at <clears throat> the regulations of medical marijuana uh, after McGirt's happened. Uh, we can take a look at, uh, um, you know, some of the issues that we had with criminal codes that poss possibly violate certain constitutional rights by Oklahoma state citizens and state statutes. Uh, so it's just an overall basic outline of how we can move forward as a council. We could develop uh, uh, some questions that we need to have answered, go investigate them, and bring them back to this council and take a look at a pass them either updating our criminal laws, uh, expanding our criminal courts, and talking to some of our surrounding attorneys, uh, and also look at possibly bringing in some of our, we have a, a Cherokee Bar Association. We have a president of that. You know, there's going to be some information that flows through them on issues that they're seeing that we may not be hearing about. So if we can start getting some of this information coming into a work group, that work group could then dissect it and try to help uh, alleviate some of the problems that the administration are faced with because they're dealing with a lot down there. So that's the reason why I brought it back up and, and hoping that we can move forward with trying to get some, some work groups started. A little bit for any questions on that. So what, um, what laws were you talking about that might be un unconstitutional? What do you, which one are those? Uh, 
that one was referred to in a court case uh, that actually was held here. Um, let me bring that back up. Uh, it's in my email. I have to go back here. Um, give me just a second. That one, excuse me, speaker. Sorry, it's taking me a little bit of time That's to fun. go through my notes and try to find out where that one's at. <clears throat> So many emails to be a little bit easier to get to. All right, here we go. I think these are preliminary hearings on that one. Uh, that court. Um, court case was dealing with uh, CMR 2028 and then the court criminal code that was being used we'll look through this order in our courts um, it would be uh, Cherokee Nation CA 751 was the Cherokee Nation tribal code <clears throat> uh, which uh, deals with our preliminary hearings case not being involved so it's Title 22, Cherokee Nation, CAS Section uh, 751. That one's going to be that one that deals with that proceeding there. <clears throat> and also definition in criminal proceedings, Title 22, Section 1151, or 1175.1. I'll forward this to you as speaker as well as as far as the court uh, proceeding that happened whenever it was used to dismiss a preliminary hearing. Uh, and as an Oklahoma State statute that says that, that says that an Oklahoma citizen has afforded rights to have a preliminary hearing. And since our court would deny that, it would deny possibly an Oklahoma citizen's rights for a preliminary hearing. So those are just kind of the basic outlines to look at, how we can maybe structure something to avoid sending our attorney general's office back to the federal court because we might be violating someone's constitutional rights. Okay. Well, yeah, that, <clears throat> that preliminary hearing uh, deal is interesting to me. I, I would have to get an AG opinion on that. But well, first of all, uh, Julia, I believe you had your hand up first. Go ahead. Okay. I, I, I don't know, you know, it's a lot of numbers that have been thrown out here, and I don't know what that code specifically says, you know, because I'm not familiar, haven't memorized everything in our law. Um, what I'm hearing, if I'm hearing correctly, uh, is that you're proposing something that would be sort of an information gathering group. You've named different sort of right. people and sectors and so forth just to kind of help to inform ourselves a little bit more about this transition and then possibly to also look for uh, ways in which we as the legislative body could propose uh, additional things where we see gaps or we see differences. Um, jurisdictionally or culturally or whatever it may be between Oklahoma law and, and Cherokee Nation law, uh, something like that. Because I also think we're not, you know, we're not experts in law. There's not an attorney on this council, right? Not a single one. And so uh, I, I do think that um, from the description, at least, that I was hearing that there's kind of a fine line here, and we don't want to be stepping on the toes of those who actually are and who are actually developing these kinds of uh, codes, because it's a monumental job. But I, I you know, if it's, it's, if it's about information gathering for the purpose of how we could assist that process legislatively, um, then I, I could see some merit to, to doing something like this, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's basically why I was wanting to bring it forward. It's an informational gathering uh, tool to where we, we are asking questions here, 
It's a way we can take them back and bring it to a work group. The work group can ask more questions and look and research to get more answers and then bring those answers back to our council here and also work in connection with the courts and work in connection with the administration of how we can alleviate some of these problems that, are, that we're having questions about. Keith? Yeah, I think uh, the, the request to me is way overreaching for what it's stating it's trying to accomplish. Uh, lots of things are mentioned in the request, but when it boils down to it, it sounds like uh, uh, it started with a discussion about uh, not having preliminary hearings. And so we're making, proposing a work group that sounds like a fire truck when what we're asking for is a fire extinguisher. You know, we, we don't need a fire truck for this, this issue. We, it needs to be focused on, on this, this one issue if we were to have a work group. If we're going to create a work group, it needs to really be focused on a, on a single issue. Uh, not not these overreaching issues and the way that it was proposed sounded very overreaching uh, it sounds to me like it is getting way over into uh, the uh, separation of powers when you're getting that broad so um, with that in mind I would like to uh, make a motion to table us indefinitely second. all right we have a motion and a second all in favor now you got to have a discussion on the motion uh, itself there's a motion second we still have discussion on that on that motion okay. that's been called go ahead so yeah br bringing that up I, I don't think that we have a motion to dismiss indefinitely and I don't mean to be overreaching and I hope that I didn't come across that way I know it sounds a little bit broad of what we're looking at but because McGirt is broad it affects every sector and if you look at the hunting and fishing compact that just got dissolved then you would say it is broad and that's why the work group would be formed is to take a broad look at information that we need to take a look at and get it back to the council and try to help assist the council try to help assist a process of making policies and laws that would affect things that are tied, tied and tethered to McGirt there's no question that the governor's office is trying to do everything in its esteemed power to overturn McGirt and every bit of the opportunity like we had all discussed here uh, yesterday with the hunting and fishing uh, uh, compact so yes to answer that and the reason why they're trying to make a, make a motion for a dismiss indefinitely uh, you know should should be denied and should look forward of trying to have a few people who would like to create and be involved with this work group to try to figure out how we can alleviate some of these problems that are now arising so appreciate it speaker yes sir uh, Julia yeah, I'm just I'm just looking at this, and just from a, um, a procedural perspective, I'm not sure that a motion to to table indefinitely applies on something that that is not an action item, right? This is just a discussion item. That's all. It says possible action, but we haven't taken any action, you know. So I'm not sure we it's it's even appropriate to table a discussion item indefinitely. That's, well, even even all. going back, maybe even a little bit there's actually no resolution to vote on so really um, it is it is a moot point to table it indefinitely I would agree with that and I would withdraw that under that uh, scenario uh, however it doesn't take away the intent of I believe the um, broad for what's the uh, intent Julia, go ahead and respond. I haven't heard anything be proposed. A proposal is somebody actually makes a motion to do something, and nobody's done that. So I don't think there's anything here that, you know, yeah. We're just talking. And Sean? Yeah, I would just, from what I'm hearing, it's, you know, it's stuff that, that we, each of us do every month. We get from our constituents problems, whether it be, body and and try to work on it and you know the to me this is this is our work group groups on like Keith said specific things but but uh, I think well intended but to me we already do that um, and you know the table indefinitely you know maybe not just but it's been on our it's been on our agenda three or four times so why don't we why don't we uh, all say Yes, I want to be on that group or no and form it or not and just move on. Can we? That's my thoughts. Thank you. Um, Danny. 
uh, is, is this a proposal? To, we, we have committee. We have housing committee. We we have re, we have all these different. Is this the formation of a new committee that we can do this with? Because from my understanding, and I'm a new counselor, but my understanding is the health committee and the housing committee. These folks meet once a month and are supposed to get these problems worked out before they bring a resolution or something to the council. So, you know, my question would be, is this a new committee we're trying to form within the council or, 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 or what? Because, you know, if we get a committee up that we want to talk about something, you know, we're not, we're not supposed to be political. We're supposed to be after what's best for the people. So with that said, you know, I mean, we don't want a committee that every, every month just picks a point that they're not happy with and starts trying to, you know, dice it up. So, you know, my, my suggestion would be to get, if we're going to do a committee, it needs to be something that's actually going to be, have some teeth to it and, and, and help us. Johnny. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, <clears throat> I think that uh, I understand kind of where, where Councilor No Fire is going. I, I think there are merits to that. I think there are merits to, to some things that you brought up. I'm also extremely sensitive to uh, what uh, what uh, Councillor Austin has brought up about uh, you know cross pollination of uh, you know separation of powers and that type of thing. I would ask that we that that the a solution may be to sharpen our pencil a little bit on on uh, what what you're proposing and and go after the the one of the specifics uh, more like more like what Councillor Austin was saying. Let's go after one. Let's go after that uh, preliminary hearing issue, and and form something to do this specific task. And then and, and then once we see the merits of that, we can branch out from there and, and decide on another another issue as we go. Instead of taking a shotgun approach, let, let's go in with a sniper rifle here and and see if we can't uh, uh, meet meet your needs. Because I can see where you're going, and and I see the merits of it. Um, uh, but I, I see and understand some of the other concerns. Thanks, Speaker. Condessa. Um, well, this is, would be a question for Councillor No Fire. Um, with the establishment of a working group like this, would you see this including other individuals outside of council, or would it be um, composed solely of, of, of councillors? And I would also like to offer a, uh, a point of correction to a previous statement that was in um, our agenda for rules, not the third or the fourth. I appreciate it, Councillor uh, T. Um, actually, yeah, it uh, it would just be first start off as a work group with just our counselors. Um, that's that's the basic fundamental of having the work group. But if we need to call someone in, someone that's an expert, someone that needs to that we need to hear in the work group, and I do think you're right, uh, Councillor Kidwell. Let's just start off with the first uh, approach at just looking at something. <clears throat> it may sound like a firework extinguisher, but we may need a, a a fire truck. You know, whenever we start looking into this a little bit more. Uh, and how it might reach out and branch out to other people and, and other laws. But I think that if we start off with just a target work group, just with something specific like that, and if it evolves into something else after we finish that, then we can take a look and decide if that work group wants to continue that path forward. So I appreciate those concerns and those questions with that. Hey, I, I guess um, <clears throat> I'll chime in my two cents. Um, I'm more to follow up on what uh, Councilman Crittenden said, and I, I'm in agreement with that. That that is that is our job, as a tribal councilman. What everything that that has been mentioned is our job. That's what we do. We're the troubleshooters here. If we have a question, you know, that question needs to be pointed to the AG on why, uh, on the preliminary hearings. Why don't we have? I mean, well, that question needs to go to our legal department, and they can tell us why. Uh, and I'm also. Um, uh, in, a, in agreement with what uh, Councilwoman Coates also said. Um, but, it, but in the end, uh, right now, there has not been any resolution. There's no resolution to vote on at this time. Um, you know, what we choose to do um, as far as a group, um, I, I agree with Council, Councilwoman Coates in that you have to be careful because there is a thin line whenever you start dealing with law because None of us are lawyers, and you know when you start dealing with policies and things like that, that's what we have our AG's office for. That's what we have our council attorney for. Which, after I get through talking, I want to ask you your opinion um, because this is why you're here, and I want to hear what you have to say. But I think that's our job. I don't think we have to force 
supposed to do. Just that's my personal opinion. Um, sir, would you tell me what you think about all of this or give me your opinion? Certainly. Procedurally, Councilor Coates can correct me if I'm wrong. I, can't we table a discussion item though? There, admit, there's not a P, there's not a resolution or a leg, piece of legislation to vote on, but we can table a discussion item. But it, uh, if that's what's on the floor, there is procedurally we can table it. With respect to what Council No Fire is proposing, it does strike me that that is what this body is tasked with doing. So if there's any specific issue or any broad overreaching issues, we need to reach out through me or reach out to the AG's office directly, however you want to do it, and address those one at a time. So it, it, it sounds like what you're describing is what's done here already. Did that answer your question, Mr. Speaker? Yes, sir. Okay. Are there any other questions? Door, you have any? Does anybody have questions? Is that a yes? Okay, Sean. <laughs> Just in case any of my students are watching. Uh, now, maybe I was wrong. It was on the on the paperwork, but I know we've talked about this three, four, five, six times. So, sorry about the about the mistake. But I should have said we've talked about it countless times. And, I'm ready to make a, do we do it or not? That's up to other people. Thank you. I think procedurally. Uh, I, I have, um, there is no motion for that at this point. Uh, we're still having a little bit of discussion. Dor, did you have your hand up? I did. Um, I just wanted to say that for the problems that I have dealt with regarding McGirt, um, the real problem is, is the egos that we're dealing with outside of Cherokee Nation. I have been able to call Chief, A.G. Hill, Marshall Buell, and we have, you know, taken care of what has needed to be addressed in my district. So I'll just leave it at that. Did you, Victoria? I just have a, a statement, and actually it may be a question toward Councilor Nofire. When you were talking and describing this, I heard you say the word investigate, and I'm wondering what you would want us to investigate, how we would investigate, and why. Thank you. Those powers are just uh, given to you with the oath of office of being able to create legislation. So your power of investigation is simply that, your power. If you want to investigate and the work group would want to investigate, we could, uh, it just depends on what it's targeted at. If it's targeted at these codes, that's what we'd be investigating. We'd, ne we'd need to get with our legal. That would be who would help us investigate. Uh, these problems that that are, are are or could arise through our criminal code, find out where this is at mention one and try to go through the rest of our criminal code to take a look at it. I don't want to overcomplicate uh, uh, the question on that far as investigation, so that's the answer to that there. So appreciate it. Appreciate the question. Okay. Julia? Councilor Nofar, I'm just wondering if research would be a, diff a better word that would not carry quite the threat, <laughs> you know, that the word investigate carries. Yeah. Anyway, I think that's maybe more what the purpose is. Okay. Keith or Danny? And, and the short time I've been on here, a lot of times things are presented and I never got the information. So I, I think it would be in the council's best interest if we've got resolutions or we've got something that going on that we, instead of giving, you know, Opinions or campaigns theories. We need to give the information to each one of the counselors so that we can we're able to make that decision I, I, I think informing informing each and every one of us with what's going on Would be part of that information if there is something going on instead of just you know Walking in or when you get your rules deal you look at it and you say well, where did this come from? Why is the reason that we're looking at this and and I think that's a, I think that's an issue because you know Information and knowing what you're doing is a big thing. Keith? Well, with uh, rather lengthy discussion so far, I now, take, I now make a motion to table the discussion permanently. Now we have a motion and a second. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it's tabling and tabling indefinitely or permanently are two Just, different things, right? Tabling something tabling. to the next meeting is appropriate to do for a discussion. Tabling indefinitely kills something. And you can't kill something where there's no motion. 
right? You can't kill it indefinitely. That's the procedural difference between them. They are different. It's not simply that you're tacking one word onto the end of something. Tabling is not uh, subject to discussion. Tabling indefinitely is. You know, so there are, there are significant differences between the two motions. Right. And so that's what's not being recognized here. If you're going to table something indefinitely, there has to be an action item of some sort that is being tabled indefinitely because it kills it, we, right? It at this point, there is it. nothing and there on the floor. That doesn't exist yet. Yes. If we want to table this discussion, you just have to say till the next meeting or yes, whatever it may be. Yes. But you can't just kill a discussion. Uh, may I ask, how do we, how do we, how do we group, as a group, make a decision to uh, table this then? You it's, make a motion to table to to a certain to a certain, certain day time. Mm -hmm. or time yes sir okay that, that's a different kind of motion as opposed to, to indefinitely table discussion specifically though. yes because otherwise there's nothing else on the floor. right and okay. it's simply and this is simply discussion at this point there has been nothing there there is nothing to vote on right now and at the end of the at the end of this it just basically we've talked and we move on so is the only way to remove this from returning to the agenda is for Councilor No Fire to choose to remove it from the from the discussion. Is that correct? We yes. don't collect well, we have the power we, to we don't, the we, there, there is nothing to remove at this point. This is simply discussion. Yeah. There's nothing to remove. There's nothing on the floor to remove. This is discussion. After discussion, if there's no action, we move on. I mean, we go to the next agenda item and it's over. What happens is that we stop talking about it. At some point. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Then I make a motion that we table this discussion item till the next meeting. Is there a second to that? Okay. Well, that dies for lack of second. Um, we'll, let's uh, let's let's. Uh, I'm just saying. Let's just finish up if we can and keep it brief. Let's let's cut our uh, comments down to a minute now because we've we've made our uh, reasoning known to everybody. Knows what we think. So um, one minute apiece, Condessa. Um, I do agree that this discussion should be concluded at this point. I, I feel as though there have been comments made in the past, and, and to uh, Councillor Crittenden's point, we have been discussing issues surrounding McGirt for several meetings now. And so I, I, do, I do recognize um, his intent in, in, in making that prior statement. Um, <clears throat> you know, there have been statements that have been made on the record by um, by the counselor making this proposal um, that the reservation is a breeding ground for criminals the Cherokee reservation is and I I feel I feel you know our our this this homeland that that we came to after the Trail of Tears I don't feel that way uh, about the Cherokee reservation I don't feel that way about my fellow Cherokee citizens and um, you know I, I feel like this work group is well intended but perhaps not well researched and I think it's time to conclude this discussion and move forward okay is there anybody else Wes that wasn't a, a, a attack at our reservation it was just merely a look at what the problems uh, uh, that have arised since McGirt and you know the reason why I was asking for this uh, protection work group is to prevent those attacks that are constantly on the threat and that's that's the whole point and aspect of it uh, you know this it would have stemmed over into looking at other aspects of our tribe and our tribal government the fact that we're not set up as a as a constitutional government to be able to handle McGirt's criminal aspect of it so how can we broaden ourselves we also need to take a look at our constitution I think one thing that's in the room that no one's looked at or discussed is the fact that we every 20 years must ask the citizens whether or not to have a constitutional convention that has to be asked and that if no matter how you're viewing the law of our Constitution, whether it was the 1999 passage or the enactment of the 2003 passage, 20 years from that would be 2023. So we're quickly approaching that. That's another reason why a protection work group theory in that word protection is to protect that. So okay. that's the reason why I was trying to bring it up. And I don't, it seems like I get a lot of okay, resistance for that. That's your time, Councilman. Okay, so, thank you. But I uh, appreciate uh, you giving me a minute there. All right. Is there anybody else that has anything to say? Now, don't you be pointing fingers, Sean. All right, here we go. Um, 
since there is no um, further action on this issue and discussion, discussion is completed, we are going to move on to the next agenda item. Under new business, uh, number one, uh, EO, would you take that? Yes, this is a resolution confirming the Tribal Council appointment to fill the board member's seat with Cherokee Nation Sequoia High School Board of Education. Put this in form of a motion. I have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Oh, hold up. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Discussion? Sean? Do we need to put a name to that? We need to put a name to that, I guess, before we vote on anybody. <laughs> yeah. So do we have any nominations for that? I nominate Cheryl Roundtree. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any other nominations? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Ground. I've been involved with children and teens pretty much my entire life as soon as I was Gosh, I guess 19, I've always been involved in some kind of activity through church or through public service with children. All right. Again, um, any questions? All right. Congratulations. Oh, Candessa, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. Go ahead. Yes. Well, thank you for being with us today. Yes, I am just so pleased to be able to uh, offer your nomination for reappointment. I've heard nothing but wonderful things about your time with the Sequoia School Board, and I'm just thrilled to have you back on board and, and wish you all the best in your upcoming term. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate your nomination. And all right. Thank you, ma'am. You have a good day. You too. All right, number two, uh, Rex, would you take that? Yes. This is an act of Title 18 of the Cherokee Nation. Code and code, and I put that in the form of a motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Oh, we have to have a discussion on that. Uh, well, okay. We, all right, we'll have discussion. We normally don't, but I guess we do. All right, uh, does anybody have any questions? All right, go ahead, Julia. Wow, I was going to wait until all the discussion had died down to make my remarks. <laughs> I can't believe there's no discussion on this particular item. Well, I guess I can with 13 sponsors, but um, I've, uh, I have significant concerns about this. I have no illusion that, you know, that uh, this will not pass or that I will change anyone's mind about it, but I do want to go on record with my concerns, and I'll... I'll share with you why that is. Um, this is, uh, in, in, in the questioning that we've done already with CNB, um, what's come up is that in the last 16 to 17 years, the $6 million cap that is presently exists on any capital expenditures uh, before they have to come to council for approval, right, has been used three, maybe four times in the 16 years, 17 years since this cap was placed on them, uh, it was presented to us that this is, you know, it will alleviate them having to come to us all the time as though it was a bother to us, you know, for them to, to come to us. But that averages to about once every four years, you know, that they come to us. That's not a bother. And it never should be a bother when we're talking about this kind of money, right, that, that we should... Um, that we should know what's going on and, uh, and, uh, and should have that approval authority. Um, what CNB is wanting to do is to scale this to their, um, to their assets, their overall assets, is my understanding, to 3.5%, uh, and, and that in a real dollar amount, right now that would amount to about $41.5 million. That is a significant increase. That is a seven-fold increase in the amount uh, that they can expend before having to come to us for approval. Um, it's a tenfold increase in their assets from 2005, which was reported at 173 million until the present assets, which are valued at about 1.8 billion, if I'm recalling. Imagine if in the next 15 years we had another tenfold increase in those assets and another sevenfold increase in what 
three and a half percent would amount to. That would be something around $280 million that we would be giving authority to CNB to spend without any council approval. And if we think $41.5 million, I think it's an enormous sum already, but, but two hundred. I mean, the point I'm trying to make is that we are effectively relinquishing any oversight of the capital expenditures of our corporation. Right? We are effectively relinquishing any oversight. And to me, that is, that's reckless. We are the only guardrail here. We are the only entity that CNB has to come to, right? And rather than looking at that as a bother, we, we are here to back up CNB, right? We are here to say, yes, this is good. This is a good expenditure, you know? We are the second set of eyes on their expenditures. And if we aren't there, there's nobody. There's no one else. There's no one else. And many entities on these kinds of expenditures not only have two sets of eyes on them, they have three, you know? And, and we're gonna take away even the second set of eyes is, is certainly what this looks like to me. Um, in questioning, under questioning, they couldn't specifically identify what this is needed for. I asked this question several times, you know? There was no specific answer. We might want to buy some warehouses. We might buy, want to buy some office buildings. $41 million worth, you know, even $6 million worth. What, what is the need for the increase? And that question was never satisfactorily responded to um, in, the, in the questioning that I, uh, that I engaged in. Um, it was brought up that we will get their reports, you know, so it should be there. We'll see what it is, but we get those reports after the fact, right? A couple months after the fact, uh, in most instances, when it's far too late to really do anything about it. Comments were made that these guys have done a good job for us so far, and they have. They've done an extraordinary <laughs> job. We are all so proud of what CNB has accomplished but we also have to recognize that we are not just legislating for today and the present board and the present circumstances. You know, we're, we're legislating for the future. And we don't know what the future is gonna bring. Um, we, we have a lot of trust right now, but as this dollar amount goes up, I, you know, my level of, I, you know, the thing I've thought is I wouldn't trust my grandma with $41 million, you know? That's an awful lot of money and I see people you know, compromising all kinds of ethics and principles for a lot less than that. And I, I, I think this is of concern. The thing I really want to get on um, record about here is that even if we relinquish our <clears throat> approval authority here, it does not relinquish our ultimate responsibility. Under the Constitution, we are the body that we often say is in control of the purse strings, right? Has authority over that. And that does, you know, like any board, any council, um, we're a governmental entity. Uh, legal opinions that I've sought, and I'm sure there will be others that will differ, but uh, the legal opinions that I've sought said that we are liable in our personal capacity. CNB is still ultimately an asset of the Cherokee Nation. That's us, right? That's our body. And if anything goes off the rails here, the potential for each of us to be liable in our personal capacity still exists, even if we have legislatively um, relinquished our authority, essentially, over this. The Constitution says, no. Nope, we are ultimately responsible. We cannot, in fact, relinquish that authority. The last point I want to make is that it was stated that, um, that this is outdated. The $6 million amount is outdated. I researched this with some of the other tribes to see what their uh, caps were. On the Creek Nation, 
any uh, expenditures in their gaming, which would include capital expenditures, anything over $300,000 has to come for council approval. Anything for other businesses over 50,000 has to come to council approval, right? For the Chickasaw Nation, they present an entire budget uh, for their corporation to the council and the corporation's entire budget must be approved annually, right? And all of their capital expenditures are included in that budget. So everything comes in front of the council for approval. Um, another nation who shall not be named publicly, but I will tell you in private afterwards, says they don't have any approval authority and it has cost them millions. And they look to us uh, for the model. But my fear is that we're actually heading in their direction. If we effectively remove uh, this kind of cap, uh, because none of us, I think, can foresee a situation where expenditures are going to go over 41 million and a half, right? So essentially, we're just giving free reign uh, without any council approval and not any necessarily any knowledge until afterwards. We are potentially setting up a situation where, at some point in the future, the CNB board becomes a, 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 an entity that has more authority than does the Tribal Council of the Cherokee Nation. And I just, I, I, I don't want to see that happen. So I'm, I'm making these statements. I will be voting no. And um, the reason I'll be doing so is that I'm hoping, I really hope nothing goes off the rails. But should it go off the rails, uh, I, I want some personal coverage here, you know. So, thank you. Thanks, ma'am. All right, because of uh, the time, we if there's any more um, discussion, we'll be limited to two minutes. Wes? I'll try to keep it quick, and I don't want to limit the time as this is the people's business, and I don't think that they uh, should be feel rushed either to what we have to say. Yes, we are charged with the fiducia responsibility. That's what we're elected to do. Uh, this kind of request is astronomical. You're going from $6 million, which has never been a problem since I've been on council. Never time, not one single time has CNB said, we have a problem here. We can't make a purchase because of this law. But yet you're having a step up from $6 million to $42 million just to kind of keep that and configure that. If they've got, if they, the business, have that much in uh, assets left over or something they would like to acquire. That's 360 roofs for our citizens. That's 140 full ride scholarships to colleges. Not just any colleges, these are state big OU, OSU college, college, um, uh, uh, colleges. That's a lot of money that we could be helping out our citizens and they're just asking us for an unended amount of time period to spend that. Um, I think it would not be uh, wise for me to vote for this. I think that it's a concern. I think it's also something that I'd like to point out. I don't know if anybody else in here has done real estate acquisitions before, large, big business acquisitions. You're not going to have a $42 million acquisition happen within 10 days, which is what you can call a council meeting to have an approval. That will never happen. I've never seen one happen. My wife, who also worked on a several hundred million dollar acquisitions, uh, for different businesses that she worked for in Florida. That was something that would never happen. It takes months to have something like that done. So to give up our right, there's only one question that my citizens are concerned with, which is that's a lot of money to be, like you said, buying off individuals' own ethics and what they're willing to compromise themselves to do. So I think that we need to place a hold on this until uh, it becomes an actual problem or becomes a theoretical problem, because right now it's not even a theoretical problem because CNB could not even give us one. So the alarm's gone off. Yep, My two minutes has been over. <clears throat> um, but I, I think you know we need to we need to if anything make a motion to table this until it becomes something else. So, Daryl, I, I tend to agree. I don't see what the haste is. No, he did not. He said somebody needs to make a motion. 
It just it just simply is a large sum of money. Now, if, there, if we already have the six million in place, if they are requesting forty one million, then they can come to us and just request that we do a one time forty one million dollar purchase without having to create law that gives them the authority for that much money. I appreciate what you said about you know we are we we have to we have to uh, uh, make sure that we are good stewards and being responsible in our spending and what we allow. Man, if we want to purchase a hundred million dollar hospital, we, we let's do it, let's go. But we don't have to have the open checkbook there on the same, I, I don't know, I just, I just like the idea if they're, if they're needing 41 million for anything in particular, come to us and ask us. But I don't think that we ought to put it in the law that they have permission to, to do this. Thank you. Okay. Um, we're going to, I want to hear some input from CMB, and I, I understand that we have um, several on the line. Uh, Doug Evans, are you there? Mr. Speaker, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. So, in 2015, uh, I don't think I, I need to give a history lesson to the Tribal Council because it sounds like you're fully aware of, of how this issue uh, got its birth. The, uh, the scaling of the asset holding, uh, the attempt was to, as uh, Councillor Coates mentioned, bring the, the authority up to the size of the organization as, a, as it was relevant to the size of the asset holdings of the organization in 05. And, and we all at CMB appreciate the, the kind words about the growth and the success of CMB. This request would include any real estate, anything permanently affixed to that real estate. And in the past 10 to 12 years, there has been, uh, as you all know, a significant amount of investments that CMB has made on real estate holdings of the Cherokee Nation, uh, uh, predominantly directed toward the healthcare service division. Um, the uh, former chief Baker, had a directive and a uh, uh, desire to invest within the 14 counties. At the same time, we have maxed out the investment opportunities, our gaming opportunities within the 14 counties and, and uh, saturated that market speaker. So the investments that will be going forth now with our long-term growth strategies that we completed our initiative with uh, uh, Bain and Company to develop our long-term growth strategy to take CMB to the next to the next level. The attempt here was simply keep that relationship of three and a half percent of our holding. The dollar amount is a scale amount. It'll grow. It'll go up. It'll go down based on the asset holdings in our audit report each year. Obviously, CMB, uh, we will we will abide by whatever this council decides, and that's what we will. Uh, uh, be happy to do. It's a matter of what is the council comfortable with uh, as far as this particular resolution. Um, but the investments going forward, Mr. Speaker, to execute our long-term growth strategy, which which is primarily based on doubling our dividend to the Cherokee Nation within the five-year window of time under that plan, then the investments, just the same as our asset holdings have grown uh, you know, sevenfold over the last 15, 16 years, our investments, if we're going to move the needle to return the dividends at the desired level of, of doubling it, will require much, much more significant investments. And again, as we go out now and invest outside of the 14 counties, whether that's commercial gaming or any other uh, investment that's yielding a return, that's where we will um, be, be at. And uh, I will yield to my boss, Mr. Garrett, to uh, add any additional commentary at this point, but I hope I've provided just a little bit of, of useful information. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Doug, I appreciate it. Yes, the, the three and a half, one just point of clarification, uh, and maybe it uh, was said earlier, but the three and a half percent of total assets that uh, this amendment to the Jobs Growth Act would uh, implement uh, is 
was arrived at because of the $6 million represented 3.5% of total assets back in 2005. So it wasn't an attempt to increase the percentage of total assets. It was simply a, a desire to scale from uh, based on the growth of our total assets. So it, it, it wasn't intended to, to diminish oversight or to increase uh, authority, but simply to scale that. Anybody have any? You know, sorry, Mr. Speaker. No, go because, ahead. You know, the organization itself and the decisions we make every day uh, are, are just of a, of a much different magnitude than they were in 2005. And, and this is, is intended to reflect that. All right, does anybody have any uh, questions or comments? Again, keep your comments to two minutes because we, yes, sir, questions. go ahead. I don't know how long they'll take on the answers, but uh, Doug Evans, you were uh, uh, financial uh, to the council a while back, weren't you? Yes, um, I transferred up here from the tribal council in 2012. And did whenever you were the financial for uh, the council, did you have any problems with CNB over that time frame dealing with acquisitions that were over six million dollars? No. Okay. And then you just got through saying that we had a y'all CNB has a long term growth strategy. I guess that was a plan put in place by you, or did you have an outfit come and help you guys develop that plan? A third party banning company came in and assisted the leadership team developing that long term growth strategy to ensure that we understood all of our opportunities within our existing markets, as well as where we needed to expand into potentially new markets to acquire that desired outcome. Okay, in your statement to this council, you said that the long term growth strategy was the reason why this legislation was being presented, yet I don't think anybody in this council has received that long-term growth strategy plan. So we don't have anything to back up the claim as why we're increasing it. Um, the, other quite, the other statement to along with that is that the CEO uh, um, just got through mentioning that it's just the same 3.5 scale, 3.5 percent scale. It's, it's kind of interesting that one the, the financial officer of CNB says it's a long-term growth strategy, but the CEO just says it's the same 3.5 scale. I don't know which one that is. It just seems to be a little bit interesting that those two are separate. I would like to see the long-term growth strategy, if you could provide that to council, uh, that would maybe back up the information that's being claimed and requested here today. Is that something you can share with us? I, I'm not aware of any Ray, I'm not a, I'm not the attorney for CMB, but I'm not aware of any reason why we couldn't. And just for clarification, the comment by the CEO on the scaling of staying at 3.5 obviously allows investable capital that is anticipated to execute the growth strategy to grow if we're going to have a higher yield or return on those investments. So I think what I was saying complements what Chuck was saying. We were just adding two different uh, aspects to the same topic. One is a source, the other one is a use. Right. Well, I think that um, since it's based off the long-term growth strategy, uh, it might have some good explanation as to why we need to do this. But until we have that information, there's no reason why I would take a vote on this today until we have that adequate information provided to us and have adequate time to look over. And on the phone call mentioned, um, there, there was no reason why we need to have the passes today. So I, I think it would be smart and mindful of the council to take a look at that long-term growth strategy plan, table this, and then after we take a look at that, we can bring this forward in, in a later date. So that way we can make an educated uh, evaluation of what that long-term growth strategy uh, uh, includes and make an educated vote then. So I appreciate you guys uh, giving me the time to ask a few questions and the answers you've provided. Appreciate it, Speaker. Yep. Anybody else? Mr. Kidwell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, <clears throat> I want to throw out just a couple of things. That it's a great time to be Cherokee, number one. I mean, and, and we, all, we all agree with that, I'm sure. Now, a couple of things that we need, need to remember, we're talking about big numbers because we're involved in a big numbers game. 
the amount of money that that 3.5 percent would ask would, would be amounting to at this point in time only amounts to about 15 days of operating expenses throughout the, and we're asked they're asking for that amount of money to be able to spend in aggregate throughout one year 15 days right that's how big c and b is and that's how and they need that kind of money to be able to maneuver and make decisions in real time okay the uh, uh when you talk about the the, the 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 oversight part there is oversight we're not abdicating any responsibility on oversight you know why i know that because i was at the cnb meeting last week the same meeting that we can all go to right the same meeting that's public the same meeting that we all get to go and participate in, that's where these things are discussed. And if you're wondering about whether, whether you're abdicating responsibility or not, you might want to do your, do your diligence and come to those meetings and see what's happening. Because that's where that's, that's being discussed. All right? And, it, and it, we can all go. It's, a, it's public. And it's, a, and it's incumbent upon us. You what now? We can all go. When they go to executive session, the people that are not on there, uh, that are not on the the, uh, the CNB oversight uh, advisory, need to need to step out, right? But as of, as of, as it was last Thursday, there was three, or last Wednesday, three people: myself, Councillor Austin, and then uh, Councillor Dobbins was on via the phone. That's three, all right. So there is oversight, right? There is an ability to be able to have oversight. You got to show up, right? You got to be there. Right, and I'm, and I'm asking everyone to go, right? Just like the, the Gaming Commission, Councilor T, you brought up going to the Gaming Commission. I plan on being there as well, right? Um, uh, we've all made, uh, uh, you know, as CMB grows, you need to understand that in the past 10 years, it's been about the, the dividend that they've been able to increase has been about a 600% increase. Think about that money, right? Think about what that does for the Cherokee people. And that's the money that builds the houses. That's the money that fixes the roofs. That's the money that fixes the plumbing, okay? So we're talking about big money, sure, but don't be scared away by that number. It's a big number because Cherokee Nation Businesses is doing so well. Be happy about that number, right? And there is oversight. We have oversight, right? I will be at that meeting every month, every time they have it. Right. If you want to rely on me to come back, and just like uh, uh, Councillor Austin said at the meeting uh, last week, he said, we get to go and ask as many questions as we want to. We may not have voting ability, but we have asked as many questions as we want. We can say whatever we want, and when we have concerns, we bring those back to this body for further deliberation. That is the oversight mechanism, and, uh, and I will continue to participate in that. I'm not abdicating anything. I believe that this number is needed. I think that it is a, a mechanism by which that 3.5% needs to move on and adjust for inflation, which is 42% since 2005, right? 42% of inflation since 2005. Wrap it up. We you. need to be able to make this happen. I will be voting yes. And I hope that everybody will understand that this is a big numbers game and we're not advocating oversight. Julia? I think that um, the fact that CNB is uh, operating in, in a big numbers game, as my colleague has, has put it, uh, doesn't change the fact that $41.5 million is a whole lot of money. And especially if this increases sevenfold in the next 15 years, $280 million is a whole lot of money. And I just wonder, uh, rather than scaling this, I'd be much more comfortable with a dollar, a, a set and fixed dollar amount that is reasonable. We don't have oversight. We have observation, you know, but as long as we're non-voting and we're taking our, our vote away here on anything over six million, we don't actually have oversight. We don't have any authority. We're relinquishing that authority. We can observe, we can report back, but... But if we're not voting on anything, then we don't have oversight, would be my response. 42% in inflation, a lot of that has come in the last year, <laughs> right, okay. uh, for various other reasons. So I also don't think that's a relevant marker. So with, with due respect, the main point I want to make is that I, I would be comfortable with a fixed dollar amount. You know, it's the, it's the, the attachment of this to C&B's um, 
increase in assets that is of concern to me because that means that dollar amount just, you know, could go up and up and up and up and just become ridiculous. Uh, and, and we have given up all, um, all ability to, to have eyes on it or to, to act as the guardrail. Thank you. Candessa. I appreciate all of the comments that have been made here thus far. And um, I, I believe that Councillor Coates also posed a question about what is the pressing need for the passage of this at this moment. Um, I, I think that that is a relevant question that holds a lot of weight for, for individuals who are questioning whether or not to vote for this. Um, the other thing that I wanted to address was um, <clears throat> Counselor, um, one of the at-large counselors mentioned that um, anyone can attend the CMB meetings, and that is true, but my understanding was that if nine of us gather outside of this body that represents a quorum, and there are eight assigned seats that are on the CMB advisory board, and my assumption is that everyone who was part of that advisory board uh, was attending those meetings. I wasn't aware that there were open seats that where, where we could be attending without without meeting that quorum requirement, so so I, you know I I don't I don't want there to be an impression that there are individuals on this body who are uninterested in what's happening at the CMB board meetings. I, I just thought all of those those assigned seats were being filled. I wasn't aware they weren't. Um, and then the other thing was, um, Councillor No Fire was removed from uh, the CMB board because of the the statement there's a conflict of interest. So is is that not in place, or is it only in place for advisory boards? Only for advisory board. So you can't only, serve on the two. You can't serve on the two the two advisory boards, gaming and uh, so CMB. So if it's a conflict to be on the advisory board, why is it not a conflict to be in attendance? But. Um, those those were all my comments. Rex. We have a call for question. <laughs> Look it up if you would. Hold it. Council we have, Block. We have a, we have a, no, okay. just wait. Yes. Okay, we do not have discussion on that either. So we have a motion and a second. Um, do you want, does everybody understand what's going on here? Okay, John, do you want to explain what's going on here? And then now, whatever's on the floor has to be put in the form of a motion for, for a final vote, is that? Yes, yes, sir. And it takes a two-thirds vote to pass. And if it passes, it effectively ends discussion. Correct. And we go to a vote on it. If it does not pass, then the discussion, discussion would continue. Yes. The call for the question is only to end discussion on the topic, not for the substantive legislative itself, right. legislation itself. So there's still, after, can be vote. Okay. All right. Uh, yes vote means end of discussion. No, mean, no vote, it means continue. So all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Um, that is in discussion. Now we will go straight into um, the vote. Where am I at here? I believe a sponsor puts it in the form of a motion. Yes. 
I got to get back to my page. I was on. Okay. Um, did we have a, a motion on this yet? Yes. And a second? Yes. Okay. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Aye. All right. Motion carries. All right. Uh, number three. Uh, Dora, would you take that? An act amending Title 21 of the Cherokee Nation Code annotated, and I put that in the form of a motion. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All right, there's no discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Okay, is there any announcements? Okay. Uh, the next meeting is tentatively scheduled for Thursday, January 27th at 1. I would like to say this. Um, you know, there's a lot of good discussion today. Even though we may not agree on some things, I, I think it's a, it's a great thing that people are expressing their opinions and we are respecting each other when we don't agree. I, I think it was a good discussion today and I heard a lot of good points on both sides. I mean, I mean there really was. So um, it was a good job today, uh, Councilman. You guys, uh, you represented well today. And, and you were respectful. I, th I think that's important too. Okay, I need uh, one more. All right, and a second. All right, we're adjourned. Good job.